Well, thanks for thanks for joining me and being willing to do this. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. happy to do it. I'll go ahead and warn you. I, I have a passion for finance and reading, and I love all those kinds of things. And so I, I did read your book and a bunch of your articles. Um, but I got to ask, I, I noticed you've got a lot of different um, topics that you range and kind of go over. So I got to ask, what first got you into this? And, and was there one thing that you got as like a hook or, or what was the start? How did you first come um, into this finance world? So uh, I like to say I tripped and fell backwards <laughs> into okay. uh, writing about personal finance. Uh, I'm actually an English teacher by training. Um, I taught high school English for four years. Uh, and then because I am not great at timing, uh, we moved while I was pregnant with my eldest child who was due at the beginning of the next school year. So uh, the original plan was I was going to take a year off. Um, and uh, I was looking for some writing gigs just to keep a little bit of money coming in. My, my goal was to be able to pay my um, student loans still while I was staying home. And one of the first uh sites that I got a job with was a personal finance site. Uh, my dad was a financial planner. So I did grow up in the industry. Um, I hadn't really realized it, but I'd always been a bit of a money nerd. Um, and so um, I kind of took to it like a duck to water <laughs> um, and uh, found that I really, really liked getting to indulge my money nerdery. Um, and, but also bring in what I really liked about having been an English teacher, which is, um, the creativity of it and finding ways to make things interesting for people who are not necessarily naturally interested in it. Um, so, uh, I am now known very well for retirement stuff. Um, but I think my, like my gateway financial content uh was um behavioral finance behavioral economics and that sort of thing um even when of some things like sociology and choice architecture and um uh behavioral finance and things like that and uh, i spend a lot of time thinking deep thoughts about them <laughs> And I think that's completely valid because something that I talk to with my clients all the time, and I'm sure you've, you've put a lot of thought into is that when we think about money, it's not just money. You know, it's like, I've, I've heard the phrase that money is congealed life. Like this is, this represents how much time and energy and, and sacrifice, you know, like this is, Hey, I had to stay late and I wasn't able to go to my kid's soccer practice because boss called me in and said, this project got to be done and you did it. And Hey, I got this bonus. That's great. But at the same time, you're, you're working towards ideally for most folks working towards retirement and being able to spend time with family. And then I think also how you view money is heavily dependent upon your childhood, right? So oh, yes. with, with your dad being a, a, a financial advisor and, and, and you kind of growing up in that, how, what, what was your first thought of money? Like what's your first memory of money or how did you first think about it? Um, wow. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I can remember being about eight years old, um, and taking, um, I had a piggy bank and, um, I took all the money out of it. And I, I counted it and then put it all back in again. And I remember my older sister seeing me do this and called me Miss Moneybags. And so, um, and it was something where like that, that early memory, it, I remember feeling very satisfied. Like there was, a, there was a great deal of satisfaction in the accounting that I was doing, you know, separating out the quarters from the nickels from the dimes. Um, but I also remember that there was some tension there that my sister, you know, and, you know, she, she's an older sister, they, they, they tease, but the tension was something that, uh, um, helped me understand that like, this is for whatever reason makes other people uncomfortable. So, so that's one of my earlier memories about money. Um, and it's, it was a really good indicator of who I'd grow up to be because I still derive a great deal of satisfaction in accounting. Um, so I have a ridiculous spreadsheet that I use to keep track of every penny that goes through our family's coffers. 
um, because I enjoy it. I thought, find it fun. Um, and like back being an eight year old and having my sister have that reaction, it made it clear to me, like I'm unusual in being, <laughs> in finding that enjoyable. Most people don't feel that way. So, so that that's, yeah. So, so it was like, with that said, I, I think it's so interesting how people have those different approaches and perspectives and you can, you can kind of take that in a healthy way or you can take it in like a, a, an unhealthy way. And so for you was part of it, having the funds, like being in the piggy bank and saying, okay, I have this many quarters. I have this many nickels. What was it? The fact that you have it, or does that, it, was it the idea of like, okay, now everything's in the appropriate box. Everything's where it should be. Was, was it a little bit of that too? Yeah. Yeah. It, it was definitely the like, okay. Uh, you know, everything's where it should be. I know, I know exactly how much I have for this. I know how much I have for that. Um, and, uh, if I recall this piggy bank, it wasn't just, you know, like a piggy bank. It was uh, one where it had a separate slot for each, coin oh you and had so, like the deluxe uh, piggy it, bank yeah yeah it was uh and when you put them in it would tell you how much it was so one of the things that i was enjoying was i was double checking the math <laughs> nice you were saying is this thing and actually so, accounting properly is it does it have yes. all the right numbers nice I yeah love that. um and so so that's something um I took into adulthood when I, my first job out of college, I worked at Barnes and Noble, uh, worked there off and on for about four years. Um, I made $8 and 25 cents an hour, um, which was back in 2001, but it still wasn't much money. Mm -hmm. And I can recall still feeling that same sense of satisfaction, uh, when I balanced my checkbook and uh, I got paid weekly, I got about $250 a week and it was always my goal to have at least 18 to $20 in my check checking account to get from one week to the next, once I've paid all my bills and everything. And, um, it was a little nerve wracking. I mean, I, I, I'm very lucky that my parents would never have let anything bad happen to me. If I needed to call them, I could, right. um, but just the, the being able to reconcile my account and know like, okay, this is what I have. I can't spend any money between now and, and next week. Uh, you know, I've got a $5 bill in case of an emergency. <laughs> so there, there's something about the keeping track of things that and, I find fun. <laughs> well, and, and it, I don't know about you, but for me, I feel like there's a, there's a stress relief when you know where you have and where it goes. And, and that's something that, again, I, I talk to clients about all the time is, starting off with, do you have a budget? Because you've had, you've got folks that, um, and it's oftentimes I find it's the folks that are higher net worth that may not have a budget and you go, well, how much do you spend? You're, I'm not really sure. It's like, I'm maxing out my 401k and I'm putting money in my checking account and it's, it's going places, but I don't really know. And you would think, well, you'll be fine with the assets you have, but you, when, when you're not sure that question of, am I going to have enough and where is it going to come from? So I, I talk to my clients a lot about the different buckets you know, having those three different buckets and, and kind of knowing, okay, this is your, this is your immediate money. This is your money for growth. This is your money for income producing. This is your money for down the road, you know, kind of those, those sides of things. Um, have you noticed when you, when you're writing as your kids have gotten older, as, as you've kind of, kind of changed and, and developed, have you noticed, I know you said you do a lot more retirement writing now, but has it shifted how you feel about certain topics like when you when you come at it, are you coming at it with different eyes than you were maybe when you first stepped out of teaching and this was just a writing gig because it, it seems like and tell me if I'm wrong it feels like when you're reading what you've written it feels like something you have a genuine passion for right you you, you enjoy it and you want to share that and I feel like the first time you wrote maybe it was all right this is something because I've got a newborn and, and you know it's it, it's a, it's a paycheck but how how do you feel like it's changed over time uh, well, I feel like money is something that we should have changing views of over time, and we often don't. Um, and it's it's because we tend to be very, very black and white about money. We're like, you're either good with money, or you're not good with money. And I, I I reject that. I believe that every single person out there is good in, with some aspect of money, and everyone is a disaster with some aspect of money. Um, so, you know, even Warren Buffett has something that he can't do himself, um, and even people People who are hustling on the street are good at something. Um, 
so so that's that's something that uh, I think because we have this black and white view of money, we have a hard time recognizing that your view is going to change and um, and deepen over time. So my view of things, um, often it's not so much about the money as it is about like my attitudes towards like family and things like that. So the an example I'll give you is my view of life insurance has changed drastically over my lifetime. Um, Growing up, I can remember, and this is how you know I was a money nerd, I actually paid attention when my dad would talk about his work. I remember my dad made it very clear that he felt that life insurance was for income replacement. And mm -hmm. so once you get to a certain age, you just don't need life insurance anymore. So my father passed away uh, in 2013. Uh, I was 34. My sister was 37. We did not rely on him for income in any way, shape, or form. But he had a life insurance policy that we were the beneficiaries of. So it was in direct contradiction to what he taught me. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, that's the most stressed I've ever been about money in my life was was when I received this, this life insurance payout. Um, because um, unlike, you know, people are typically stressed about money because they're worried about not having enough. I've always, because of the way that my brain is wired, I've always felt comfortable even when things are close to the bone i know what to do when receiving this gift that i knew he meant as a gift um i was stressed because it felt like i couldn't be glad to have it because that would meant mean that uh, i was um in some way glad that he wasn't with us oh so i understand that um like recognizing mm -hmm. the fact that he wasn't following the rules he taught me was really kind of mind blowing and it made me understand that um, things like life insurance are not just simple dollars and cents. You know, it's not just about, you know, income replacement, even though that's what I'd explicitly been taught. It's also about if I needed to have a couple of months where I didn't do any work, this would allow me to do that. Um, and then I then continue to like uh, expand my view of life insurance because another really strong opinion my father had was that you don't buy life insurance for children. Um, because as much as my dad was very much straightforward, rational thinker, um, he, he would describe it as like, I don't like that ooga booga stuff. <laughs> is how right. He would put it. He was also very superstitious. He's like, we're not buying life insurance for children. Like, no, just because we don't want to, we don't want to introduce that bad juju. We're not, we're just not bringing that yeah. thought into this house. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so having been through the experience of of losing a loved one and how that affects you just not just financially but emotionally and uh, mentally and um psychologically uh made me realize well no actually there are good reasons for why a parent might need life insurance for their children i still i'm enough of my my father's daughter that i don't have life insurance for my kids because i'm like i can't do it just i'm, I'm just but you've got it for you in case something happens to you but you're like not not for the kids the the, the nine-year-old yeah. doesn't yeah. need it or, or or the 14 year old or the two-year-old for that matter yes yeah. yeah and and i think that's where life insurance um i i i look at all insurance really as a tool Right. Whether we're talking about life insurance, whether we're talking about annuities, whether, you know, whether we're talking about long term care, even homeowners insurance, car insurance. It's like but life insurance, I think the way you look at it when you are uh, 25 and you've got a spouse and and small children and a car payment and a house payment, you know, it, it, it really is that income replacement. It's making sure my family's going to be OK if this if, if I disappear. You know, if I'm no longer part of the picture, it's are they going to be able to sustain the lifestyle that they they had prior to that? And then when you get into um, your 50s and your 60s and maybe the house is paid for, the kids are out of the house, it becomes more about leaving a legacy. You know, it becomes more about, you know, uh, uh, asset transfer and, and maybe taking IRA dollars and their taxable dollars, turning it into tax free dollars and, and doing it in the most tax advantaged way, you know. But uh, I'm sure I, I I don't know your dad, never met him. But uh, I'm sure he did not want to incur stress. You know, I'm sure he thought of it as as a stress relief. I could I could hear his voice in my head going like, buy a car, do something fun, right? Um, and uh, and that was something that also helped me understand that money decisions are emotional, 
because Absolutely. my dad had this very rational, this is what life insurance is for. And yet he had done this very emotional thing. I want a gift for my girls. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, and it helped me understand, because at the time I was patting myself on the back going like, oh, I'm being very rational about this. I'm spending money on things I know my father would approve of. Uh, you know, I put money in the kids, uh, um, uh, 529s. I, I put some money aside for my retirement. I, um, uh, we, we gave money to charity, like a couple of things like that. Um, and it, meanwhile, my dad in my head is going buy a car, <laughs> do, do something <laughs> fun. Really fun, take that trip to um, Italy, you know, go skiing, yeah. do, do enjoy yeah. it a little bit. Um, yeah. and so that, helped me understand because at the time I was just like oh I'm being so rational and meanwhile no it was not um but it helped me understand like money decisions whether they're small or large are emotional um and oftentimes your most emotional and disordered money decisions are the ones when you're most convinced you're being rational <laughs> um and that that's been very helpful for me to kind of be able to look back on that situation now and recognize what was going through my mind um and you know help other people because this is something that i have seen in other instances where i talk to people that they are the beneficiary of life insurance or receive an inheritance they have a similar sort of like i need to get this money away from me because it means i'm happy that i've lost this person who is so important to me um and helping people kind of get through that knot and that tangle of really difficult emotions because money is good money is you know supposed to be a gift and and helpful and yet at the same time like i'm feeling terrible and sad and i've lost this person uh so i can't be happy at all so it, it's uh it's i find it a fascinating topic because in part because we so often treat money as black or white you know, it's, it's something you're either good at or you're not good at, and that it's something that you just make good rational decisions about and move along your day. I think you see that a lot with, um, with like proceeds from life insurance, but you also see it with stocks. Like I, I see that a lot where I'll ask somebody, I'm like, Hey, I noticed you're holding 42 shares of AT&T. What, why is that? The rest of your portfolio is, is totally different than you got this one account with just this handful of shares. What's going on there? And they go, oh, well, my grandfather worked at AT&T and he, he got those shares and then my dad got them. And then I, and you know, so they're looking at these shares sitting inside of a Fidelity account and they're, they're not looking at it as an investment. They're looking at it as honoring their grandfather's working memory, right? You know, it's like, and I, and I think that there's something really beautiful about that as long as it's it's in a way that is that is honoring the memory and not harming you financially right because you you can have something that can be a good thing take um saving you know saving for retirement is a, is, is a powerful tool but at the same time one of the things i I've, I've had come up with clients a lot and and i'm sure you've heard this is when you have that personality that mindset that's a saver you start that early you do that often, you know, pay yourself first, max out that 401k, then, then start the Roth again. You know, it's like, just kind of go through the line, save, save, save. Well, now you're into retirement and you're going, okay, I'm taking money out of these investments, but I also got to make sure part of that money goes into my savings account. And I go, wait a minute, you got 120,000 in your savings. We're taking money out of your investment account so you can stick it in a lower interest savings account. They go, well, I'm supposed to be saving. You know, it's just there. Mm -hmm. It's it's that psychological break that can be very difficult. And I think stepping into retirement, going through loss, um, any kind of major financial change, whether it's a new job, you're making more money than you ever made. Or, you know, you, you've lost a job and now, now we're having to replace that income somehow or, or, or your, your tax situation has changed. You know, I think all of those, they're very emotional decisions along with financial decisions. So I, I think like what you're talking about is very common in part because we tend to think of money as like an on off switch. So like mm -hmm. you save for retirement and then you're, you're taking money out for retirement and it, it, it's, it's stressful if you're someone who's like, like feels comforted by the fact that okay oh money keeps going into that investment account it's going up that's good oh no it's going down well you know right. money is a tool it's not meant to just you know be a pile that you can swim in like scrooge mcduck uh and i think one of the things that i would love to see more people doing is recognizing that this is never a like set it and forget it situation whatever you're doing with money you need to be uh flexible 
and willing and able to uh, make different choices depending on circumstances. So when I was teaching, um, it was uh, my last year of teaching was 2010. So I taught through the 2008 um, downturn and I knew a couple of teachers who were supposed to retire then. Now it's a little different because teachers have like pensions and things like that, but you know, some of them had uh, spouses who had to change, change plans. And that's a very extreme example of it, but we tend to think of like, okay, so I'm going to work to be 65 and then retire, but retirement should be a moving target. Absolutely. Oh, like if, you know, you get to be 64 and things are going gangbusters, you know, now, now might not be a bad time to just go ahead and retire and, uh, you know, move some stuff around to make sure that things are balanced so that you'll still meet your marks. Or if you're approaching retirement and things aren't going super great, well, okay, you know, maybe I still don't want to work the nine to five, but I can do uh, something, something part-time, some consulting to keep a little bit of money in so that I don't have to take um, uh, as much out of my, my account. And so that's the sort of thing that I think people just they want the binary, you know, like I'm working and now I'm retired rather than it being like, okay, what's going to be a good soft landing for me. And, you know, once I've landed, I'm going to keep walking. <laughs> you know, this is, this is not, uh, not something where you, you move until you stop. Well, I had one of my clients tell me, you know, we'd been, we'd been working together for years at this point. And he told me, he's like, Matt, I'm so excited about retirement, you know, and, and we're a year out and he's just, he's already excited. Well, we're six months out. He's so excited. You know, finally retirement comes, we sit down, um, he turned in his notice. We, we, we helped him with, with, with some rollovers and different things. And, and he was loving it. You know, I was like, how's it going? He's like, I'm loving it. Well, three months later, we sat down for our next, next, next visit. And I said, you know, how are things going? And he looks at me and the smile breaks across his face and he goes, Matt, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. And I was like, what is it? And he said, I start my new job on Monday. And I went, are you kidding me? You've been talking about retirement for years. And he looked at me and he said, it was an offer I couldn't turn down. He said, I'm, I'm raking sand traps two days a week. I work in the golf, uh, the pro shop for three hours, one day a week. All my green fees are covered. My buddies can ride with me. And he said, I couldn't turn it down. He doesn't need the money, but he loves his new job. You know, it was like, and, and it's, it's, it's time away from the house. It's with, it's with his friends. He's able to do things with his coworkers that, that he enjoys being on the golf course. He was like, I was going to be there anyway. You know, so for him, I'm like, Hey, if you're working in retirement, I have no problem with that. If you're working cause you want to work. I think if you're working because you have to work, that's a different situation. And that's where I feel like that that early planning ahead of time can make a big difference to kind of stave that off. But um, but I'm with you. I, I feel like your working years, um, they don't necessarily have to stop just because you hit that, oh, I'm, I'm eligible for, for Social Security. I'm 62. Or I hit full retirement age. Or I, I, I finally got through that health care bump at 65. You know, those are kind of the three big ones you see. Um or even if you want to go out early before 59 and a half, there's ways to avoid taxes on that too. Um, mm-hmm. Now, Absolutely. is there, is there a particular area in your opinion that you either you keep getting requests for, or you keep having come up as a topic or, or an area that people tend to be more concerned about, or you think is, is not um, spoken to enough? Uh, there's a couple. There's um, well, you brought up social security. That's one that um, I feel like there's a lot of misinformation out there about social security. Well, there shouldn't um, be. You wrote a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, but but go on. And some of it is because it's this huge program. It's been around for so many years. I mean, it's it's uh, nearly 90 years old, uh, yeah. and so you know, it's understandable. And like, it's something that doesn't affect you until it does. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so you you don't really know much about it. And so one of the things that happens with social security is people get very concerned about making sure that they get their money's worth out of it. Um, And so people are, uh, they, they, the Social Security Administration no longer does this, but for many years they would show you the break-even point, where um, what would happen if you took your um, your Social Security benefits at 62 versus at your full-time age or age 70, um, and generally between like 62 and and taking it at age 70, um, the 
break even point is about age 72, 73, um, because you have a lower benefit for longer starting at 62 versus a higher benefit. And there is this sense of like, I paid into it for all these years. I want to make sure I get my money. Right. And that is completely comprehensible. Uh, the problem is the only way to win that equation is to die young. So <laughs> oh, I think that's also where, you, you know, you look at it and you go, this is why I think social security maximization makes so much sense because maybe we take yes. one early with, with a married couple, right? Maybe we take one early, you delay the other. And, and then because odds are good, one of you is going to make it well into your eighties, into your nineties, you know, just look, look at the actuarial tables. We're living longer. Right. And so that break even point of should I take it at 62 or should I take it at full retirement or should I delay it all the way until 70? Because I, I think if you just said, let's maximize Social Security, how do I maximize my Social Security? Well, the answer would be take it at 70. It's 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 yeah. the biggest number. It's maximized. But that may not be the best way to do it. Right. And and I think that's where I'm, I'm this is this is a soapbox of mine on Social Security, because I feel like there's the there's the mathematics behind it. There's the numbers, there's the information and you can, you can still find calculators online, right? I know the social security office doesn't give it to you. And then you got to go, well, is this yeah. one accurate or what did they actually use for their formulas? <laughs> you know, but, but you yeah. can find calculators that tell you what you make. That's information, but it doesn't give you that confirmation of working with someone to, to tell you, am I making the right decision and, and where are my other sources? And, and if I'm not pulling it from here, where am I taking it from? And then also what impact is this having on my taxes and should I be delaying it so I can do a bigger Roth conversion? You know, that, that kind of thing. But I, I agree. Social security is, is not an entitlement. You know, it's your money, but yes. also there's, there's so many if thans or except fours, I, I do feel like, uh, it's uh, I don't know if you, um, are you a comedy fan? Like, like improv comedy? Oh yeah. What, yeah. what, what do they always do? Yes. And that's it. You know, it's like, so someone will ask you a question you answered about social security and they're like, so that's all. And you're like, well, yes. And <laughs> it's like, except for unless, and, and you feel like you have to put 18 qualifiers behind any answer. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, the person goes, I don't even remember your original answer. So was that a yes or a no? (laughs) Well, it's funny with social security. I feel like you have the opposite problem of um, talking about financing. So when you're talking about financing a car or something like that, people focus on the, um, like the, the monthly uh, amount you have to pay and like, Oh, I can, I can afford $350 a month. doesn't matter. It's a seven year payment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And they're not looking at the total costs that they're going to pay over time. Whereas with social security, you're looking at like, oh, well, if you take it at 62, you'll have had, I don't know, $120,000, whatever it is by the age, by age 72. And you're like, wow, that's a huge amount of money, but you're not looking at how much you're going to get each month, which is not going to cover groceries. And so, so it's funny because like we get, um, we focus on little numbers to our detriment sometimes and we focus on big numbers to our detriment sometimes uh and we really need to switch when we do those (laughs) so focus keep the majors major keep the minors minor right yes yeah i and i think that kind of circles back around to what what you were saying earlier and what we were talking about when it comes to a budget you know it's like if you know how much you need for groceries like when you were when you were working at barnes and noble and you knew okay i've only got 22 dollars in my account but i'm covered everything's good and and i'm going to get that next inflow on friday it's like it didn't matter that you only had that five dollar gap which five dollars did go further then than it does today Right. Did, Maybe, yes, let's yes. let's call it a, a twenty five dollar gap now, right? <laughs> but but even so, it's like that that gap was there, that coverage was there, because you knew what those numbers were, and and that's where I think it's so important to know what your numbers are and what you need in today, and then in retirement, and then factoring in inflation, because I think inflation is has been it's definitely been a hot topic lately. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that's one yeah. that people have been talking about a lot now. Oh, but, absolutely. Yeah. The, it's like, it's the silent, silent money killer. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, I mean, we saw it happen so rapidly, uh, in the last couple of years, um, where, you know, I, my husband did the grocery shopping for like three or four weeks in a row. And then I went, uh, and I was like, how much for eggs? 
Mm -hmm. um, because I hadn't seen it and it wasn't particularly gradual, but I hadn't even seen like from one week to the next, the, uh, the the increase. The eggs were due to that avian flu all of a sudden and the the supply went off. But even so it was a perfect example of like price jumps, you know, it just, Mm -hmm. it just jumps radically. And, and that's where I feel like, um, so I've, I've used this example before I've told people this, um, and where I'm going to tell you a story of the way I describe inflation. And you're welcome to, to share this with folks if you want, because I think it sums up inflation under normal conditions beautifully. So my wife and I, when we bought our furniture, we bought a tan couch. And when, when we each brought a dog, you know, kind of into the marriage, I, I brought this black lab that was the sweetest dog on the planet. And the, the lab was not allowed on the couch. Lucy was not supposed to be on the couch. That's the only place in the house the house, the couch, you know, that's, that's the one spot. You're not supposed to be there. It's the only place a dog wants to be. That's how it works. Of course. Right? <laughs> so I'm sitting there one day and I'm reading a book and I look over and the dog is just laying on the couch next to me. And I'm like, I'm about to get in so much trouble. I was like, get off the couch. I was like, Kristen's going to come in here and she's going to see, you know, she's gonna be like, what are you doing? Well, I shoo the dog off the couch and I picked my book back up, but I didn't start reading it. I'm just holding this book in front of my face and I'm just staring this dog down. And I watch this dog stalk over to the couch and just stare at these couch coaches. And I kid you not, I watched this dog. Now, this was before she passed away. She was about 10 years old at this point. She laid one paw on the couch and stretched her arm out and laid the second paw and stretched her arm. Out. And she like started kicking her back legs up like I wasn't going to notice this 50 pound dog right next to me on the couch. Like she was like, I'm a ninja. I am silent. And I'm like. That's inflation. That's that, that's inflation. It's not a black lab launching itself in your lap, sending your book flying, screaming, I'm on the couch jumping around. It just it eases up on you day after day after day. And it's it's one of those things is like that's what I always describe inflation as because it's it's a true story. <laughs> just like that I feel like it ties in. But this last few years, it's been that dog jumping in your lap. And so my question for you is, um, and I'm looking for advice here because I, I talk to people about inflation all the time. How do we communicate the importance of it when you don't feel it? When it's, I've got one paw on the couch. I'm not, I'm not jumping up and down. You know, it's like, I've got a little bit of maybe even just the wrist, you know, it's not even. So how, how have you kind of shared that importance, that, that continued importance? Because otherwise you start to feel like, I'm preaching it's going to it's going to rain and you're like bring your raincoat or always keep your umbrella in the car and you yeah but it hasn't rained in 6 weeks what's well, every day mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh you know this is one of the those really hard ones because so much of this has to do with how little people want to think about money Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, people like thinking about like the fun stuff, like winning the lottery or retiring or, or things like that, but they don't want to think about the, the simple day to day stuff. Um, and so that includes things like, you know, what are you going to do if like inflation means you can't afford Christmas presents this year, you know, or whatever it is. And so for me, what I think is really, um, important and helpful is to remind people that, by avoiding looking at your money on a regular basis, you're not actually avoiding stress. You're just relocating it. Um, and actually you're increasing it. Mm-hmm. So if you choose not to not to engage with your money, um, day to day may feel a little stressful, but when the money is on fire, whatever the problem is, when you realize I can't afford this huge inflation jump, you know, something major has happened and I can't afford my life anymore, um, or even something minor has happened and it's crept up to the point where now I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. I don't know how it happened. That kind of stress is going to be so much bigger than the minor stress of having to look at things on a weekly or, you know, uh, uh, like bi-monthly basis. Uh, would have been. And so letting people know, like, it's totally fine if you don't want to pay attention to your money, just know that you're, you are signing up for bigger stress later. And is that really what you want? Or would you rather just do a little bit every day? Uh, and so it's kind of like, cause we've all been there in, in, uh, in college. Uh, there was the, the first year in college when you're first out on your own and you don't do it 
any laundry and you're running to the store to buy clean underwear. Um, and finally it's like, okay, I got to do all the laundry and you're at the laundromat for like a day and a half cleaning everything. And that is a major pain versus like you just do a load every, every other day. And it's, it's not that big a deal. So it's, it's kind of like that. Whereas I think if you uh, keep an eye on things. You'll know when Lucy's got her paw up on the, on the sofa, and you 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 can't stop inflation. I mean, you can tell Lucy no <laughs> off, but right. you can't stop inflation. But you can see it coming, and the and start making different choices. Um, you know, choosing to have uh, you know more meatless meals, for instance. You know, just little choices that uh, you know you aren't even really going to notice, rather than it be all of a sudden. Oh my goodness, I don't know how I'm going to make rent. Right. Yeah, and and that's where I think so much of it. You you really touched on something when you talked about you know the the psychology of money, like the the stress that people experience because, and and it doesn't. I feel like that that concern doesn't seem to matter whether you have um, very little and you're starting out, you know, you're beginning this journey and you're going, I don't even want to look at that credit card debt because I don't, I don't know how much it is. And if I know, then I have to address it. And I just, I, I can't, I can't open it. Or if you're going, I'm fully set, not worried about me personally, my kids are going to be okay, but I still can't open my brokerage account because I know the market was down and it's just going to make me, you know, it was like, the th- that same avoidant behavior can kind of creep through regardless of how much or how little you have and and that's where there's been times with folks i've i've had i've had folks come into the office before and they've literally brought in envelopes and and they've said i've brought in my statements and i go great you know this is this is a first meeting i'm sitting down we're supposed to talk about things you know how are you, how are you set up you open it <laughs> You know, it's like, well, I, I don't even know how much is in there. I don't know how it's invested and I'm scared you open it. And it's like, well, let's open it together. <laughs> let's, let's go through this together and, and, and start to uncover where you are, how it's positioned. But, um, I kind of think about it. Like when you, have you ever cut your hand when you're in the kitchen, you're, 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 you're cooking and, and you cut your hand and, and you immediately grab it and you, 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 you throw a dish towel in or something. And you kind of go, I know it's bad. I don't want to look at it. Because if you look at it, it's real. And for a second, it doesn't hurt. And you're like, I know I heard it. You know, it's like, but but I just don't want to look at it. That, that's how I sometimes feel with when it comes to finances. And I, I think you're completely right about keeping an eye on things is really important. But um, I, I also think, and, and this is where I appreciate the fact that you've written so much about these different topics and things and, and that you're you're producing all this content. And, and I, I hope people take things out of this podcast as well that are, that are beneficial because it's it really is that that progression, kind of that moving forward, working on it day by day. Right. You know, it's like it's it's a day by day kind of progress that that makes the big difference in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. And like what you're talking about, about just not wanting to look um that is such an understandable human response. You know, we, we, we try to avoid pain. Um, and it's almost never as bad as we think it's going to be when it comes to finances. That's not to say like that it's not stressful to, you know, have a, a huge credit card bill and it's not stressful when the market takes a downturn. Um, the, those, those very much are stressful, but we, we tend to put so much emphasis on what our money can do or what our money is doing. Um, rather than on what we can do. And uh, it's something that I find interesting because um, we give money agency when we're the ones with agency. Uh, and so, you know, you see that from like, oh, you know, how my, when my ship comes in, how, how my life would change if I won the lottery and so many things. And it's like, well, you know, you don't actually need the money to change your life. Now that's not to say like there are people who are in really serious situations, abject poverty, absolutely money will change your life. I'm not going to say that's not true. But for the majority of us, we put the things we want on the other side of something we don't have necessarily have control over. Um, and so, you know, people who are like, well, I want to travel, but can't because I don't have the money for it. There are ways to make it work. There are ways to travel, even if you don't have a lot of money. Um, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. There are ways to get the things that you want out of traveling without a lot of money. And so 
it's, I think it's because we so often use money as the shorthands for solutions rather than kind of thinking creatively about like, well, how can I solve this problem without money? Um, and that's something that I'd love to see people do more of and feel more uh, in control of their lives because it's not the money that allows you to do things or doesn't allow you to do things. Um, you know, it certainly helps. I'm not going to say it doesn't, well, and, but and I, you can allow yourself. I, I agree entirely because I, I think that, you know, from an education piece, there are some times where you might read something or, 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 or you come across something and it's not applicable yet. Right. And then you revisit it later and you go, okay, you, you could read the same article and get totally different things out of it at one point in your life versus another point. And, you know, something that I think about is I, I have fostered a love of long distance running. And when I started running, it actually ties in along with my, um, my career in finance, because at the time that I started running, I was coming into the office at seven in the morning from seven until nine, I was studying for the series 65 and, and, and my life, life insurance and those kinds of things. So I was studying until nine. I was working from nine until five 30. I was coming home. I was eating dinner and then I was diving back into the textbooks and I was, I was studying from about six 30, seven until 11 o'clock at night. And that's what I was doing. And then on Saturday I was studying for about five and a half, six hours. Sunday I was spending about three hours. I was doing it every day and I was going crazy. You know, it's like you, 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 we're not meant to just work incessantly. And so I started going running and it was an amazing stress relief. And so I started running. I, I threw a pair of shorts and a pair of shoes in my car on my way home from work. I stopped by this little tr uh, trail. I started, I started out, I made it less than 10 minutes and I was doubled over trying not to throw up. I mean, it was, you know, I was like, I, I made it 10 minutes. I don't even think I ran the full 10 minutes. It was, it was not pretty. And the thing is, I, it took me 10 minutes to get out. It probably took me 20 minutes to get back to my car. I was out there for half an hour and I was just like, I was like, this is terrible. Well, you do it again. You do it again. You do it again. I'll never forget the first time I was running on this same trail and this stump that was always my turnaround point. I went past it, you know, it was like, and, and then you come back and people go, well, how'd you run your first marathon or how'd you do a half Ironman? I was like, well, let me tell you, I'm not some incredible athlete. It's not like I have some superhuman strength or, 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 or anything like that. It's just that consistent, repetitive work yields so much in results. Nobody can just throw on a pair of shoes and go out and run a marathon, but you can build and anybody can run a marathon. I, I believe now, but, but not everyone will. And it comes down to that, that mindset and that willingness to do it. And that's where I feel with finances, you know, there is such an emotional component because if you tell yourself, well, I, I'm just bad with money. Like you said at the very beginning, you know, if you just say, well, I'm just bad with money and my, my family's bad with money. Well, then unfortunately you're kind of, you're writing that story. It will be true, but it doesn't have to be. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the self-fulfilling prophecy of, of, uh, the money scripts that we carry are so common, um, where, you know, you just decide like, well, this is not something I'm good at. So, and a lot of times it then goes into, and good people don't care about money anyway, and I'm a good person or, or, or something along those lines. Um, and uh, you, you know, justify you, it. You, uh, you find a way to justify it. Yeah. You solve, solve the problem by redefining it. Right. Um, and we all do that in some way or another. I mean, there's, there's, there's things that all of us have blind spots on and, and um, recognizing what you're doing that isn't serving you is I think really important. Um, you know, I, I, I've been kind of a navel gazer my whole life. And I think that's part of why I went into financial media because I, there have been times where I've made decisions where I'm like, why on earth did I do that? And like kind of spent some time like digging into my own psyche or, or the, uh, I can remember, uh, once when I, I made some financial decisions, not serious ones, but like, I wasn't sure I wanted to buy something, but it was buy one, get one free. So I bought it. I'm like, I wasn't sure I was going to buy it. Why did I need to? <laughs> Yep. Yep. So, and spending time thinking about like, like, why did that marketing work on me? What, what did that like engage in my brain that made me make this decision that I wasn't sure I wanted to make in the first place. And so spending time 
thinking through like, what isn't working for me? Why isn't it working for me? What would, what would work better? Why would it work better? Um, I think that is going to be very useful and much more useful than, um, you know, every single time you're feeling overwhelmed with money, you're like, all right, I'm going to get it right this time. I'm going to buy this product and I'll, I'll be organized with money, or I'm going to download this particular app and I'll be organized with money. Um, I know that that's, it's really easy to fall victim to that because you're thinking like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just throw ideas at the, at the wall, see what sticks. Um, but you're going to be much better off if you actually start with some work within and, and start thinking like, what's not working, what yeah. is working, what am I good at? You know, recognize that, that, that you are good at some aspect of money. Um, and, you know, use that as the kernel for building out rather than starting with like, I'm really bad at X. So I need someone to fix that for me. Right. Because you could look at, um, eating out, you go, oh, well, I never, I never pack my lunch. I always, I always eat out and I could, I could be saving money if I, if I pack my lunch and then you realize, well, it's like, is it really about the food? And, and because you could take that from a financial aspect, you could take it from a health aspect. You know, there's so many ways you could take that, but then you might upon further reflection realize, well, actually I've got some major stress in the office and I'm just fleeing this space. You know, it's like, and the fact I didn't pack my lunch means I don't have to sit in the break room. I'm running away, you know? And I'm not, I'm not saying that's the case for everyone, but, but I think sometimes it's like when you look at it and you go, well, what is causing me to have these patterns? Like what's, what's really producing this? And it may not be about the money at all. You know, it might be, yes. Yes. Uh, it, it might be, but in many cases, I think it's other things. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's interesting that you, you mentioned the, the lunch because when my first office job, um, I, I, I went to Subway pretty much five days a week. And it's because if I brought my lunch in with me and was in the uh, in the break room, my boss would come get me if the phone rang. Like, hey, nobody's answering the phone. And so it was like, I could either go sit in my car and, and eat my lunch outside. Right. Or I just left. I would just leave so that, they, that I could actually have my break. So it, it, circumstances can do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I, I, I don't know how... Uh, I don't know how, how that would be today because I feel like your manager would just go, Hey, well, guess what? We were on an online system so you can download this app. So while you're at star, yeah. you know, like while you're getting your Starbucks coffee or while you're getting your subway, you can still answer the phone. It'll be fine. You know, yeah. um, that, that's where, that's where the, the healthy boundaries comes into play and a, a conversation yes. needs to be had. But, um, well, let me ask you this. You've, you've got kids, right? Mm-hmm. You mentioned um, earlier when you were talking about the, the the life insurance you inherited from your dad, uh, you mentioned 529 plans. Do you feel like those are the end all be all for college planning or are, in, in your opinion? Because I've got I got some thoughts around it. But what do you feel like if, if you've got someone who says, hey, I just had my first child or we just welcomed our grandbaby. What, we want to do something. What what are some thoughts around things that folks can do? So uh, I'm of several minds about 529 plans. Um, so we have them for for both our kids in part because they're there. It's it's you know, the Mount Everest. It's convenient. <laughs> yes. Um, and we're in Wisconsin, and uh, there are are special breaks um, uh, if you use University of Wisconsin, um, use the money for University of Wisconsin schools. So there's 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 benefits to it. Um, and with the, there were changes in how you could use 529 um, uh, accounts, which I actually makes them more useful. Um, you can use them to pay down, I think like $10,000 with their student loans. You can use them for things like um, uh, private school, K-12 private school now as well. Um, and the fact that you can transfer them to other family members is also really, really helpful. So those are all like great reasons for it. Um, I, I would throw in a fourth one too, being around that you can, as long as it's been in uh, their name for 15 years, you can reallocate it into a Roth account, you know, for your, for your child or for your grandchild, you know, it's like there's yes. the, the secure act and the secure act 2.0 brought in a lot of really, um, I would say just beneficial options around 529 plans. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think there's still some restrictions around them. Yes. Yes. And, um, 
I, part of my my concern about them has less to do with the 529 accounts themselves than with the cost of college. Right. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, we've created this whole ecosystem around how to save money for education, um, which, you know, so many people are just not able to do, you know, they like, and it's, if you open a 529 account, because you cannot do it for a child who has not yet been born, you know, the, the child needs to have a, a social security number. Um, so if you open a, a 529 account on the day your child is born or your grandchild is born, you get a maximum of 18 years of growth. Um, and generally people, right, when they have a baby, are not going to have a whole lot of extra money <laughs> to set aside. So... It's and, and that's where grandma and grandpa stepping in or aunts and uncles yes. for birthdays and and you yes. know that that's where the the whole family unit is able to to help and and that that's the that's the one nice thing is everyone kind of allocated into that yes. same fund. I I do really appreciate that that the the ability of of family to uh, to to contribute and then also because it is not counted against uh, you when um uh, when it comes to um financial aid. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, that's, that's so all of those are, are, are great. Um, it's, but it, it's, it's a difficult thing because like the average amount of money in a 529 would pay for a semester tops. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, you get this kind of, it's a yes. And again, where yes, this is a great tool. A lot of people are using it and that's fantastic. And people just kind of feel like having it is enough and, and don't really know, uh, they don't know as much as they need to, to really make best use of this tool. Well, uh, and so that's something I'd love to see more people talking about. And even the investments inside of it, I find people tend to just put it into a target date fund, which at times can be a very beneficial tool, especially if you're not as financially savvy and you just want to set it and forget it. But then mm -hmm. the closer you get to uh, that that target date, whether it's in a 529 plan or in a 401k plan, um, usually what that means is we're going to get more conservative. Well, more conservative means more heavily weighted towards that fixed income allocation, towards bonds. Well, what about the last couple of years? We're in a rising interest rate environment. Those bonds, the, the feds are telling you that that portion of your funds is going to go down in value. That That's something where you go, maybe having 40 to 70% allocated towards fixed income doesn't make as much sense as I thought it would being two years away from college or being two years away from retirement, you know, and, and, and I think that kind of goes back to, to echoing around the, one of the common themes that I think has come out of this conversation is, is this eyes on. You, you got to have eyes on those investments. You got to, you got to be aware of what's going on. And I know that's where something that we do in our firm is we have plan reviews. We, 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 we look at the plan and, and we talk about where you're at and if we need to make changes and, and, and adjustments. But um, something I preach to our advisors all the time is if you're spending the whole time just talking about returns, that's a wasted meeting because, um, if you started, let's say uh, you came on board as a client of Semax, and you said, I'm, I'm giving you guys $100,000 to manage. And, and a year later, we sit down and you go, how'd it do? I'm like, well, we're having our one-year anniversary. Can you believe you came on board a year ago? That's amazing. Um, you started with 100 You got 110 You're up 10%. Awesome. Or markets haven't been doing well. You were a really aggressive investor. You know, It was like you, you started with 100 Right now, you've got 92 You're down 8%. Okay, well, what are we going to do about it? Well, are you still aggressive? Yeah, I'm not worried about it. You know, I've been writing about finance for years. Market goes up, market goes down. Just let it roll. Okay. How much time did that take? It's like if all you're talking about is returns for the hour, it's like, well, wait a minute. We're not getting into tax planning. We're not getting into estate planning. We're not getting into that legacy planning. You know, it was like we're not thinking through how are we going to be the most advantaged and in our, in our appropriate allocations. And, and so that's where I feel like you, you've got to look at it holistically when we're talking about planning. And, um, I think taxes is probably the 800 pound grill in the room, right? <laughs> uh, it's so easy to forget about taxes in any direction. I mean, it just, there's, it's easy to forget about how taxes are going to be affected when you get, um, you know, 
a raise or a major mm-hmm. bonus. Um, mm-hmm. It's easy to forget about um, how taxes will affect your retirement plans. Um, it, and it's just, it's not part of our day-to-day thought processes. Um, and yeah, it can, it it's, can be a serious um, issue that, you know, can take you by surprise and no one, <laughs> no one goes, we, yay, <laughs> when it well, comes to a surprise tax bill. And, and that's also where I think when it comes to taxes, we, we have a tendency to get so focused on what am I going to have to pay next year? Right. It's like, what, what do I owe come April? How much is this going to cost me? And not always think about, well, what is the total tax consequence of this going to be? So if you take a 22-year-old and you look at him and say, hey, I know you're, you're single, you just walked out of college, um, put that money into a Roth. Well, why? I'm paying taxes on it. Yeah, you're paying at the 12% tax bracket. You'll be, come on, where are tax, tax brackets going to be 30 years from now? And, and, and you've got 30 years of growth tax-free on it. You know, it's like that should be in a Roth. Versus somebody who's six months away from retirement, they're in their highest income earning years, their their income's about to just just plummet next year, and they look at it and go, well, wait a minute, maybe I should be putting everything in pre-tax, but you said Roth is great. Well, it, it, it's dependent. Where What are you going to do this year? What are you going to do next year? And then five years from now, 10 years from now. Um, but I, I think taxes are, are a huge component, and unfortunately, that's the great unknown. We're, we're having yet another conversation about a government shutdown. Who knows? Who knows where taxes are going to be headed into the future? And so, um, crystal ball, what do you got? What are you thinking? Where are we going to be five years from now? Oh goodness! Um, I I know that one's that's that's a tough one. Yeah, um, I do. I think probably not in five years. I think I think they're going to uh, like go down to the buzzer. But I do think that we are probably going to increase payroll tax for um, for Social Security. Sure. Um, as of right now, it's uh, capped out at I think one hundred forty seven thousand dollars per year. Um, right. And I, yeah, I believe, I think if if it went up to two hundred fifty thousand, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but I also I, I know that uh, it's going to be something they wait until the last minute before that goes through. Yeah, so we got about 10 years now. before we see that i think yeah i think i think we're gonna see that major leap because it's it's up it went up to like 160 something and, and it's like i think you're i think you're right there on the money i think it's gonna keep climbing um because that that cap on social security is a little bit different than medicare medicare they don't they don't ever put a cap on that you know um and then i also think the tax brackets themselves are gonna increase yeah. i think we're definitely gonna see an increase in the bracket size um and unfortunately, and and you can a, a, agree, disagree, but I'm going to make a statement here and, and you tell me wh- wh- whether or not you're on the same page. The majority of the taxes are not paid by those that don't have anything. You know, it's like if you're if you're on subsidies and, and, and you're struggling to get by, your your taxes are going to be I mean, there's going to there, we all have to pay, you know, state sales tax and things of that nature. But but your taxes are going to be negligible. And the ultra high net worth, they have things in the most tax advantaged way to where they're really not paying much either. It's really on the back of the middle class. It's it's us working folks of America that are paying the, the lion's share of the taxes. And unfortunately, I don't see that changing anytime soon. I, I only see that increasing. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely agree with that. I think um, when you get to like that ultra high net worth, you know, you've got the people who can afford to have an army of CPAs who can, you know, figure out every single tax advantaged account and loophole and, and, and all of that. Um, and then, you know, when you get to people who are just, you know, regular working folks, um, even if they're in a good situation where they can afford a CPA, where they can afford to have someone else do their taxes, um, that doesn't mean that they can afford to have money set aside into a certain type of, of uh, tax advantaged account uh, because they need it liquid because they, they need to pay their their, their bills. So I, so I would definitely agree with that. Um, I think that one of the things I wish people understood a little bit better about our tax uh, program um, is the progressive nature of it. Um, I use the um, like kind of visual example of um, a tower of champagne flutes. 
So if you've ever seen where they they have like, uh, it's like a pyramid and they start pouring from the top. And if it's a tiny little bottle of champagne, it just fills that top flute. But if it's a larger bottle of champagne, it goes down to the next and the next and the right. next. Right. Um, and so if things are working the way they should, you know, a, a Mondo bottle of champagne, someone who's making like $500,000 a year, would fill all the way down to the bottom of the pyramid because they are making um, enough money that they're at that highest tax bracket. But you get, you know, things ca capturing the champagne a little bit further up. <laughs> um, and that's that's one of those things where like, anytime I write about um, the tax code, uh, it's not my favorite financial topic to write about. Um, I find it really interesting though, because and when you drill down to any one particular tax law, you can kind of see the intention behind it. It's when you look at it all in aggregate that it becomes insane and overwhelming. <laughs> and so that's something that is is uh, is really interesting about how our tax code works and why the middle class tends to bear the brunt of of increased taxes and the high net worth folks do not. That's also where I think it's so important to work with a team because, you know, it's like I, I, being a CFP, I'm not going to give you specific tax advice. That's your CPA's job. You know, being a CFP, I'm not going to give you specific legal advice. That is your attorney's job, right? But but uh, something that I talked about, I actually spoke about this recently, is where, uh, and it kind of kind of burns me up, is that uh, pastors and 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 elders at a church will say, "Hey, you should put the church in your will. You should leave ten percent to the to the church." Well, for most of us, unless you've got north of twenty four million dollars as a married couple, you don't have to worry about estate taxes. The, the The proceeds from that will, you know, is like the 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 sale of the home, the the checking account, the savings accounts, the cars. You know, it's like you're you're gonna get that tax free. So if you leave a hundred thousand dollars to your kids, your kids get a hundred thousand dollars. If you leave that hundred thousand dollars to the church, the church gets a hundred thousand dollars. If you have an IRA account and you leave it to the kids, let's say they're paying twenty two percent federal, five percent state, what are they going to walk away with out of that hundred thousand? Seventy two, seventy three, right? If you leave that same hundred thousand to the church out of the IRA, the church gets a hundred thousand. So uh, w whether it's a church, whether it's a uh, the Humane Society, um, I, I'm you, you mentioned eating less meat. Well, my wife and I, we for health reasons, we went vegetarian a while ago. So I'm I'm all for that. It it saves you a ton of money at the grocery store. But yeah. it's like w whether you're leaving money to the animal shelter or whether you're leaving money to the church or anywhere else. I'm not saying don't leave money to charity, but are you doing it in the most tax advantaged way? And unfortunately, an attorney oftentimes will look at you and go, Oh, you need to talk to a CPA. And the CPA will just kind of glare at you, <laughs> right? They're kind of, and then you say, "Hey, can I do this?" I read this article by uh, by this lady named Emily, and she said you could do. And then they go, "Oh yeah, you can do that." I was like, "Oh, well, why didn't you tell me that?" And I'm like, "Well, you didn't ask till now." <laughs> you know, it's like, and that's where I feel like the tax code. You know, it's, it's the same thing when I'm talking to my clients. I'm like, "Hey, w have have you considered this? Have we brought up that?" You know, it's like in and 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 looking at that robust plan because there's so much to it. It's difficult to really drill down to everything. And then you talk about that champagne flute. Well, we also all know you don't grab one of the glasses from the bottom, or the whole thing's going to be crashing down, right? You know, you you can cause yourself <laughs> massive tax issues if you're not careful. So, um. At any rate, let me let me ask you this. If if folks are listening and they say, Hey, she's got some really good examples. I'd love to read more of her stuff. Where where can folks find you? Um, I know you've written a number of books. You wanna maybe tell folks about the some of the books you've written and, and kind of where we can where you can read more? Sure. So uh, I am the author of five books. The most recent is called Stack, Your Super Serious Guide to Modern Money Management. And I wrote it with my co-author, Joseph Salcihai. That is a lighthearted look at money. So um, it's uh, actually very um, good introduction for young adults in particular. Um, <laughs> and uh, we wanted to make a book that people who don't necessarily read money books would want to pick up. Um, my first book that you mentioned uh, is uh, The Five Years Before You Retire. Um, and then I, um, third one that I'll just, uh, uh, put a bug in everyone's ear about is end financial stress. Now, um, that uh, I talk a lot about the kind of, uh, behavioral finance that I find so fascinating. Um, you can also find me at emilyguyberkin.com. 
Um, it's E-M-I-L-Y-G-U-Y-B-I-R-K-E-N.com. Uh, I'm also on uh, Twitter, Threads, and Blue Sky uh, under at Emily Guy Birkin. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. I, I've enjoyed it. Um, I always love talking finance with folks, so I, I hope I didn't talk too much. I'll let you let you speak, but I it, it's a passion <laughs> of mine, and, and I, I thoroughly enjoy it. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me.